little bit of an update while you're turning there, a little bit of an update on Wayne. Talked to Tammy, and uh, she did end up taking him to the VA. And uh, uh, he and he actually has a pulled strain muscle. Uh, and, and while that's not good, that's painful. Uh, I told Tammy, and she agreed 100%, and I'm sure Wayne did. Uh, I would rather it be that than be a kidney stone. Uh, because that's something that just has a way of recurring over and over and over. But uh, it is very painful for him. So, uh, and it, you know, it's one of those things you didn't really, uh, uh, and, and if he told this story, he would say, Tammy is just working me to death. Uh, Tammy's not buying into that. But, uh, uh, you know, you can just be in, uh, I, I've, I know Terry understands this. I've, I've done this with my back. You just be in the wrong place and just turn a little bit. And you've, you're in a fix. So uh, that might have been the case. But do continue to remember Wayne in prayer. And I'm, I'm glad that it's not a kidney stone. John chapter 14, verse 1. John 14, verse 1. The words of our Lord, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also." Sometime back when several of us went together back up to the Pennsylvania Dutch area, uh, right in the real hotbed of where one of the largest uh, Amish communities is. Now there there are pockets of them. There's a big, big population over in Ohio. But right there in Lancaster County is one of the biggest areas of the Amish people. And I have, uh, I'd had the fortune down through the years, of not only the years I was with the Brotherhood, we went up in there, but also in later years when I was with the McLaughlin family, we went to that area several times. So I had been introduced to that culture before. It kind of fascinated me. But it, 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 I, I was renewed again because this time, the nature of the trip, uh, normally when I've been up there before, we were just singing. We were going into churches and singing and packing up equipment and leaving and going somewhere else. And we, you didn't get a whole lot of that, uh, the kind of thing that we did on this trip uh, where we rode uh, in, in, a, in a wagon, in an Amish wagon, pulled by a, a young woman, who young girl who was who was Amish, and uh, she told us about things. And and again, I was just intrigued, fascinated by those people. And I think the thing that really fascinates them, uh, uh, me about them, is that they are people that are steeped in tradition. Uh, They don't change. They don't change. Uh, you don't see Amish buggies up there, Lord, with uh, 48 inch wheels on them. They, uh, Josh, they, some of them don't decide they want to put flames on theirs. And, and I remember asking our host, David Hilliard, the first trip up there, I said, Why is that so? What's behind all that? Why do all the men look identical? And the women, the same way. And the children, why do they all look just alike? And he told us, he said, it's about tradition. He said, there is so much fear in the Amish community about promoting yourself to be different than somebody else and given the ideal that I'm better than you. I don't have to dress like this. Or I don't have to drive a buggy like you do. 
So they, they work real hard at sameness. Never changing. Never changing. I did find one thing early on in the trip that I thought was interesting. The kids, the young kids, they had already found out a way to make a little money. Just small kids. And you'd see these little boys and girls out there. And these little girls, these long dresses on. And, and the flowing bonnet. I mean, they were gorgeous. Just little small girls. Now, older Amish people, particularly an Amish man, if you go up to him and try to take his picture, you've probably got a fight on your hands. They don't go for that. But now the kids, they would pose for you. Because they know they would be rewarded. So they were being influenced somewhat, I guess. But tradition, such a big part of their culture. I don't know of any nationality of people that are more into tradition than the Jewish people. They have held on and they have maintained, even to this day, Many of what I would call the conservative faction of the Jewish people. Still. If you go to modern day Israel, you'll see a lot of changes. You'll see skyscrapers and things like you see anywhere else. But if you go into outlying areas, you'll see things, uh, I am told, that are not a whole lot different than they were in the days of our Lord. Again, it's about tradition. Just before Jesus went to Calvary, He gathered His disciples together. And that's where our text was in John chapter 14. And these three verses that He quoted unto them, verses 1, 2, and 3, when He spoke them, those disciples of His, particularly those of Jewish descent, would have known immediately what He was talking about. He said, I'm going to prepare you a place. But He said, I will come again and I will receive you unto Myself. I'm coming back for you. That where I am, you may be also. They would have knew immediately what he was talking about. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to take you, and some of this is going to sound so strange for you, admittedly, but I'm going to take you back to what was a normal courtship period for a young Jewish male. And we will add in his intended as we get further along. Then when we get through with that, that's where it really gets exciting. Here's how it started. Here was the initial beginning. The groom left home to look for his bride. I don't know exactly how that worked. I don't know if dad said, <clears throat> it's time you start looking, boy. I've fed you. I've clothed you. It's time you start looking. I don't know if that's the case or not. Or it might have been just the fact that you know how boys are. You get to that age. And you begin to see the opposite sex in a totally different light. There was no set date. You didn't reach a certain age. It wasn't anything like that. But that young man knew when it was time. And leaving home didn't mean necessarily that he would travel hundreds and hundreds of miles. It could have just been a trip down the street. Might have been short. But at the appropriate time, when he knew the time was right, he left home and his intention 
was to find him a bride looking for a bride. Second, upon finding her, he had to purchase her. He had to purchase her. And this is so much different today. We don't purchase our wives. We get married and then that's when we pay. But that was the way it was in the days, even up into the days of our Lord. He would take with him a dowry. And I think a lot of that depended on how successful he was or his family. For some, it could have been a substantial amount of some commodity. For some, it might have been one of the best sheep that they had out in the flock. I don't know. But it was something that was considered of value and worth. Because when he found that young woman, now that part of the process would be very similar to ours. He's looking for a bride. And when he meets that one whom is the apple of his eye, he knows that's her. That's her. But now she's got to say in this matter as well. But if she agreed that this man would make good future husband material, they talked among themselves and the young groom went into the family of the bride and said, after introducing himself, I am looking for a bride. I have found your daughter. And I am ready to pay to purchase her. Now ladies, I know in our free society today, I understand that that might seem degrading to you. But that was just the way it was. That's the way they did it. After he found her, he purchased her. Thirdly, after the transactions were completed, the groom left, he returned home because he had to prepare living accommodations. That makes sense. Now you see, that's why I said a moment ago, when Jesus said these words, they would have made so much sense to those disciples. I am going to prepare you a place. He would go back to his home, and again, much of the tradition, actually much like it is in the Amish community, those families had large farms, and when the children come along, they had an allotment, a piece of property there that they could build their home on. And that was his job after he had found his bride and had paid for her. He went back home by himself. The bride stayed there. He went back home because he had a honeymoon house to build. Now, watch this. After one year, that was a minimum, after one year, the groom returned at an unannounced time. It could not be less than one year. That was keeping in tradition. Say, so why? I don't know. That was just the way it was. It could not be less than one year, one year minimum. But I've read in church history, and in the history of the Jewish people, that sometimes it may be two, three, four years. And there could be factors in that. It could be that, that he was having a more difficult time building the house or, or getting financially stable. There were things to take care of before he brought his bride home. But after one year minimum, he went back to his intended. 
and there was no announcement made. He never shot off an email to her and said, I'll be there, blah, 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 blah. There was no feathering of information to them in any way. It was unannounced. And I was puzzled about that a little bit. And perhaps one of the best explanations was this. You see, when those transactions were made, there was no contact between the groom-to-be and the bride-to-be. No contact. At least for a year minimum, no contact. Even if they lived in the neighborhood, they passed as though they didn't even know each other. It's amazing. But after the year, after the year's minimum, he would go back and there was no notice. And I read that there were times that the brides, especially if the time lingered on and on and on and on, and it was three or four or five years, and she's thinking, oh, I'm 16 years old and I'm going to be an old maid, you know. And somebody else come along. And there was times, actually, that when the groom went back, that the bride had gotten cold feet and reneged. So there was no warning, none whatsoever. He just showed up. Now, when he goes back, number five, he does not go back alone. He is accompanied by a male escort. I put that, I think, on the slide. There's a reason for that, and it will become more clear when we get into the next point. But right now, suffice to say, when the groom went back, all of the living accommodations are taken care of, the house is built, everything is in order. He's going back now for the express reason of bringing his bride home. He doesn't go back alone. He has a male escort with him. Now, when he gets back to her home, the story says that he waits for her on the outside. He does not enter into her home. Now, here's where the male escort comes in, at least as far as one of his jobs is concerned. It was the male escort who announced to the bride's family Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Isn't that in Scripture? Isn't isn't that in the Bible? Do you remember in the parable of the ten virgins, the wise and the foolish? Remember that? That was about a marriage, if you will. Five of them were wise... They made preparations. Five of them were not. They had no oil. But if you'll read that text, you'll find there's a place in there that it says just that, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. That's what the male escort did. The groom waits on the outside. He does not enter in to the bride's home. Again, tradition. Number seven. The bride and groom would return to his father's house where a great host of guests and a great banquet was waiting. Now here's another reason for that male escort. I guess at this point it might be better to just call him a chaperone. Let's suppose that when he found his bride, she was a great distance away. And that meant they had to travel and they had to rest maybe a night or two before they got back because the mode of transportation pretty much was walking. And those people, 
Those people were so steeped in tradition about purity. So to safeguard this young woman, as well as the young man, from anyone talking about them and saying that anything went on that shouldn't have went on, this male escort, and I understood, I read this just the other day, it was, it was said that this male escort, when they, when they stopped for the night, and the bride would be over here by herself somewhere, and the groom would be over here by himself somewhere. And you know what he had to do? He had to stay up all night. That's true. That was part of his responsibility. He could not sleep. He literally had to stay up all night. He ate no dose. Stayed up all night. Drunk Mountain Dews. Stayed up all night. He had to watch them. Make sure there was no contact. After they got back home, the groom's family is waiting. They have never seen this young woman. Never. They have never met her. Oh, they perhaps, if she was close by, perhaps they would recognize her. But if it was a distance away, many times they would have never seen her. Never laid their eyes on her. Perhaps they would grill their sons as, well, what's she like? Tell us a little bit about her. Maybe he would say, well, you'll meet her. You'll meet her soon. But the family would come together. And there would be a huge banquet prepared, set up. And they would gather in and they would fellowship. It was at that time that the groom would introduce his bride. She was there for all the family to see. After that great celebration, after the ceremony was complete, they would go in, obviously have relationships. The marriage would be consummated and he would bring his bride out literally and parade her through the little town. It was a big thing. A groom looked forward to that so much. Riding his brand new bride through the middle of the town. Just beaming and glowing. And you can imagine how that young woman, how happy she must have been. How radiant she was as well. Bringing her out for all of the community to see. Now, I'll be the first to acknowledge that there's not a lot of that fits today, right? There's so much of that that we can't relate to in any way. But here is where this really gets interesting. From a scriptural standpoint, from a biblical perspective, the church... I'm not talking about a local church, although I am talking about a local church because they make up the universal church. The universal church is known as what? The bride. We are the bride. Did you know that? Yeah. We are the bride. Guys, you can go home. Tell somebody tonight, I'm a bride. We are the bride. It's not about male, female, or anything else. We are the bride. Now, if you're going to have a bride, you've got to have a groom, right? Who is the groom? Christ. Yeah. Jesus. So let's bring it to that perspective. Let's focus now, not so much on that young Jewish boy and that young Jewish woman, but... Let's focus on Jesus Christ, the groom, and the church, the bride. We'll use the same points. The groom left home to seek his bride. Galatians 4, verse 4. But when the fullness of the time was come, watch this, God sent forth 
His Son to redeem them that were under the law. From the foundation of the world, God had a plan. Even before He created man, who He wanted so much to have a relationship with, He watched them fall in the Garden of Eden. Didn't catch Him off guard. He knew it. He watched them fall. But He loved them so much that He made a way. Because when they fell, when they disobeyed Him, sin entered into the world. And it wasn't just how sin affects us physically. More importantly, it's how it affects us spiritually. It separated us from God. And the only way we could be brought back to God was for God to do what only God could accomplish. And that was become a sacrifice for sin. And that's what Jesus did. So since the very beginning, the very foundation of the world, God the Father had a place on His time of events that He would send forth His Son. He did that 2,000 years ago. At the appointed time, God the Father sent forth the Son. Now remember, that young Jewish boy left home. He went looking for a bride. That's what Jesus did. He left heaven. Was born in a manger. Grew up to be a man. Died on a cross to save lost sinners because he was looking for a bride. Second, after finding her, he had to purchase her. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19. Paul says, Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, and ye are not your own. What's this? Verse 20. For ye are bought with a price. just as that young Jewish boy had to take a dowry with him to purchase his future wife, the Lord Jesus Christ brought the best that heaven had, His own blood. He died on a cross. The blood of the Lord Jesus Christ fell from the brow from the prints in His hands and His feet, from the whipping post on which He was beaten. Blood fell to the ground. He was paying the price. After hanging nine hours in agonizing hot, hot sun and suffering beyond anything that we can imagine, He gave up the ghost and he died. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the supreme sacrifice. Oft times we talk on Memorial Day and and, and other special days about uh, some gave all. Those who made the supreme sacrifice, they gave their life that we might have freedom in our country. The Lord Jesus Christ gave it all. He gave His life that we might have eternal life, forgiveness of sin. The Lord Jesus Christ paid the price for His bride. Do you know you, you know you have been paid for and the cost was tremendous. That ought to behoove every one of us to sometime, even this evening, falling down on our face before the Lord Jesus Christ and say, thank you, Lord for paying my sin debt. I couldn't pay it. I wasn't capable of doing it. Thank you, Lord, for doing that for me. Third, 
after the transactions were completed, the groom returned home to prepare living accommodations. After the Lord Jesus Christ finished His work at Calvary, a period of time lapsed that He might substantiate the fact that He was very much alive. He had been resurrected through and by the power of God. After that was authenticated, He went back home. Jesus said it this way. I love this verse. John 16, verse 16. He said, A little while, and ye shall not see me. And again, a little while, and ye shall see me, because I go to the Father. I love that verse. That's where we are right now. We're in that period of time, that little while. That's where we are. A little while, and ye shall not see me. He was telling his disciples that. But even more importantly, he was telling all of us. That's where we are right now. We are in that little while. I've not seen Jesus except through spiritual eyes. I've not seen him. And if somebody tells me they saw him, I would seriously doubt it. He's in heaven, it's the right hand of the Father. A little while and you will not see me. But then he said a little while and you will see me. You will see me. After one year minimum, the groom would return at an unannounced time. Now we know this for a fact. Jesus has already gone beyond that one year minimum. Did, 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 have you ever wondered, and all you have to do is read the New Testament. Have you ever noticed how much the writers of the New Testament let it come through in their writing that they expected Jesus just any time? They expected to see Him just any time. You know why? Because for many of them, that year's time would have lapsed since Jesus had left earth. And they had moved into that little while period. And they were writing. In the early church, that was one of the exciting things that they dealt with on a regular basis. They were encouraged by those who spoke to them. Be excited. Because the Messiah is coming. Be looking. Be alert. Be waiting. Again, the parable of the ten virgins fits well there. Here's the point for us. Remember I said a moment ago that the young Jewish boy came back at what an unannounced time. Unannounced time. Now let me give you a verse of Scripture. Matthew 24, verse 36. Jesus said, concerning His return of that day and hour, knoweth no man. That's why when we said it back a few years ago when there was this big stir about somebody had calculated all these numbers and everything and they had the date down. It's, it's, It's going to be on that day. And I I told you from the pulpit, when you see that, just say, well, there's another kook. I mean, mean serious. And and a lot of these are, are, are super intelligent people to a certain extent. I mean, they, 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 are, they have great doctorates and, and all these things behind them and, and in their calculations, but they're missing the most important point of all. God's Word says no man knows the time. No man. No man. When Jesus comes back, and I even oftentimes talk about it from the pulpit, that I believe, I feel in my spirit we're living in the latter days, but I have never told you that I think it's just going to be a couple weeks. That would be be suicide on my part 
That'd be crazy. And you wouldn't buy that. And I wouldn't want you to buy it. I can't predict that. I don't know that. No. I can look around and see the climate that we're living in and, and, and seeing the hearts of men begin to fail more and more and more and, and see the direction that's happening with countries lining up against countries. And you can see nations coming against them. All those things point to the soon return of Christ. But to tell you when it's going to be, I don't know. I don't have no idea. And as I told you the other night, Jesus don't even know Himself. The Father is the one who knows that. There's a place in Scripture that it talks about the day of the Lord. And it says in that day, there will be two people lying in a bed. Remember that? And one will be taken and the other left. That's how abrupt the rapture will be. That's how quickly it will take place. One will go to be with the Lord, one left behind. Why? It's because of the decision that they have made concerning Christ. That's what it boils down to. The groom comes back at an unannounced time. Number five. What about this male escort thing? We know that, that that young Jewish groom had to have the male escort because that was part of tradition. Do you know that fits right into the story? Listen to what Paul said. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. It says, The Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. Watch this. And the voice of the archangel. Isn't that something? You know where the, 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 the real great announcement is going to be when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back in the rapture? You know where the real announcement's going to be? It's when the archangel sounds forth. And I believe that call very well could be, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. And graves will begin to open. The dead in Christ will come forward. Their souls always already with the Lord, but those bodies will come up out of the ground. Many of them just skeletal remains. That's all. It, many of them have been burned, and they're they're nothing but dust. But that will come forward because God knows every one of them, and there will be a transformation, and they'll receive a brand new body. One from heaven. A brand new body. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Now watch this. This is so good. The groom goes back to the bride's home and he waits on the outside. Now what's up with that? Well, we covered it. Again, to make sure that there be nothing said in any way about things going on that shouldn't go on. He did not go into the bride's home. The announcement was made by the male escort. The bridegroom cometh. And perhaps the bride had been waiting. Maybe she had her things together. But even if she didn't, the groom waited on the outside. He didn't enter into the home until all of her things were together so she could return. Do you know there's scriptural importance to that as well? Back in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the Lord descends from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. We talked about that. Verse 17, look at this. Then they which are alive and remain shall be caught up to meet them together in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. 
Do you know when Jesus comes back in the rapture, He does not come back to the earth? He doesn't. Now there will be a time, that dreaded day of the Lord, that's actually confused sometimes with the rapture. They are completely different. You can read that in the Revelation. There will be a time when His feet will touch the earth. Yeah. And mountains will move, literally. But in the rapture, He comes in the air. And after the archangel sounds forth that great voice that the bridegroom is here and the dead in Christ arise and those who are alive and remain are changed in a moment in a twinkling of an eye. It says that we are caught up. That's, that's where we get rapture from. The word rapture just means to snatch, to, to catch away, to, to pick up. That's what He does. Caught up. Raptured away. But we arise to meet Him in the air. It doesn't stop there. After the bride and groom got back home, remember His family had prepared a great meal? Remember that? A great banquet had been prepared to celebrate the groom and His new bride. And a great host of guests were there. Revelation 19 and verse 9. Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. When the redeemed get home, there will be a feast take place in heaven like none other. And a great assembling of peoples will be there. I oftentimes talk about this fact. We get in our minds sometimes because we think, well, people come off with these facts and, 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 and everything about what a small percentage of people in the church is just really saved. And I don't know how they really come up with that. How can you determine who's saved and, and who isn't? But that's just me. But, but you hear this all the time. And, 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 and what it can do, it can cause us to think, well, heaven's going to be a little old place. Oh, no. Heaven's going to be a big place. And there's going to be a lot of people there. Multitudes. Doesn't the Scripture say that there's so many there that men couldn't even count them? It was impossible to even calculate how many people are going to be in heaven. Even if we went right now, the number would be uncountable. If the Lord Jesus Christ, if the Heavenly Father continues to delay His coming every day that goes by, more are born into the family of God. The bride increases, gets bigger and bigger and bigger. No, heaven is a big place because it's got to hold a lot of people. And the redeemed are gathered at home. And a great celebration. And there will be a banquet like none of us have ever known. That will take place. That young Jewish boy after this feast would go to the living accommodations he had prepared. He and his bride. There would be a consummation of the marriage after the ceremony. And then remember what he would do. He would bring her out. He would bring his bride out and he would parade her through town for everybody to see. Now that's interesting because listen to Revelation 21 and verse 2. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, watch this, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. John saw that in his vision. And what it means is there is going to be a time that this wicked, unbelieving world will see 
the glorious bride of the Lord Jesus Christ. He wants to display His bride. And by the way, He wants to do that on a regular, daily, systematic basis for us. He wants us to go out and be a witness for Him. It's one of the best ways that you can show yourself to be a child of the King. But someday, with great force, the force being the numbers, the world will see on full display the beautiful bride of the Lord Jesus Christ. And guess what? I'm going to be in that number. And if you know the Lord Jesus Christ, you're going to be in it as well. It's going to be glorious. So you see, when Jesus talked to those disciples and He said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, there's many mansions. The implication was there, I'm going to be going away. I'm going to prepare you a place. But even though I'm going away and preparing you a place, I will come again and I'll receive you unto myself. That where I am, you'll be also. We're in that period now in that you do not see me, period. A little while you see me not. That Jesus is coming back. And the important thing tonight is to know that we're ready. Because He could come at any moment. Watch, therefore, and be ready. Bow with me for just a second. Everybody tonight that knows in your heart that you're a part of the bride of Christ. Because somewhere, as a young person, maybe a middle-aged person, maybe even an older person, there was some time in your life that you bowed before Jesus Christ. And you said, Lord, I'm an unworthy sinner, but I believe you died for me. I believe you are the Son of God. And I'm willing to put my trust by faith and receive you as my personal Savior. Lord, save me. Forgive me of my sin. How many of you can go to a time in your life right now, show me that just by an upraised hand. You know that happened. Praise God. Oh, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Now, if you do not, and it looked to me like everybody in the the place lifted their hand, but if by some chance you do not have that peace in your heart, I would love to talk with you this evening after the service. Would you do that? I would love to talk with you. I'd love to introduce you to Jesus. I promise you it will be the best decision that you ever make. Let's stand. Keep your heads bowed and eyes closed. We're going to be dismissed in prayer. Thank you so much for being here this evening. I pray you've been encouraged by our time in God's Word. Brother Terry, will you dismiss us in prayer please?